Good afternoon, every, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to day three of uh, Sustainable Places 2020. So today we kick off with our SDIA initiatives workshop. Um, so these are all the initiatives that the SDIA are undertaking that are quite close to us or denote some of our, our thinking. So I will begin with my presentation unveiling the SDIA's Roadmap to Sustainable Digital Infrastructure by 2030. Good afternoon and welcome to the launch of the SDIA's Roadmap towards Sustainable Digital Infrastructure by 2030. Our motivation for building the Roadmap is to deliver sustainability. To reach our sustainability goals, whether they're the SDGs or Paris Climate Accords, industries need to come together and focus on systematically embedding sustainability across the sector. Our roadmap enables systemic change within digital infrastructure. The SDIA brings together all elements of the value chain and the roadmap translates their good intentions into effective actions. The ambition of the roadmap is to make it clear that sustainability in digital infrastructure will lead to new business opportunities. Through the roadmap, we can find the business case in sustainability. The fundamental problem is that the sector lacks leadership and direction. Without either of those, collaboration is nearly impossible. The interconnected, complex and siloed system that creates digital power cannot change unless each sub-industry can translate sustainability into a direction and align that direction with the direction of the many other sub-industries. The roadmap provides a universal language for organizations to communicate across the silos. It enables each actor to connect, benchmark, and deliver sustainability within their segment of digital infrastructure. So let's dissect the roadmap into its core, uh, into its core elements. The metrics section, the metrics provide the universal language that transcends the siloed sub-industries. These include resource consumption metrics, carbon and energy consumption metrics, pollution metrics, and socioeconomic performance metrics, typically uh, cost of compute. How do these metrics help collaboration? They create a universal language. They create a universal reporting, measurement, and benchmark language across the entirety of the value chain, from pre-operation, operation, and post-operation. Next, we move on to the activities element of the roadmap. Activities denote the many topics of research and progress. This is the main collaborative stage of the roadmap, where actors can problem solve together, deliver joint solutions, and let those solutions resonate up and down the value chain. The last section is the targets and milestones section. The targets essentially explain each goal and foster collaboration by focusing outcomes, aligning interests and aligning priorities. So those are the three main sections of the roadmap, the metrics, activities, and the targets and milestones. To conclude, the roadmap is the system-wide implementation of sustainability. It defines sustainability in all the necessary activities to reach it. It creates a sector-wide dashboard Give it, gives us the ability to track progress through a shared language and drive collaboration through shared targets. Now, in order to reach our goals, we know we need to collaborate. The roadmap shows us opportunities for commercial and scientific collaboration. It provides guidance for policymakers on where support is needed. Let's dive into, that how, into how that looks in practice. As a business, the roadmap gives you a map of the direction of the industry. You know what is required and when. This will help enable commercialization of certain technologies and could lead to spin-off commercializations of other technologies with other partners in the roadmap. In other words, 
the roadmap helps you find the business case in sustainability. As a researcher, the roadmap provides focus. It shows you what is needed and how, and how R&D plays into the, the wider, grander strategy of the industry. It allows researchers to shape the future and be on the forefront of change. And from a policymaker's perspective, the, re the roadmap creates a fair, balanced economy where industry can do good while doing well without doing harm. It provides the information and direction that policymakers need to ensure their policy positions are reasonable and positive. To conclude, businesses have a commercialization map. Researchers can shape the future, future through their R&D agenda and regulators can take action on the climate crisis while supporting European business. But let's be clear, digital infrastructure today does not operate as one sector. However, our Alliance is trying to change that. With our Alliance and our roadmap, we bring together many industries from across borders, from energy suppliers, data center operators, construction companies to digital businesses, establishing the roadmap as the universal mechanism of change. These industries are now joining forces as a unified sector and are collaborating, collaborating towards a shared sustainability goal enabled by the SDIA's roadmap. Let's look at some examples. <clears throat> energy companies could provide new energy as a service models, ensuring not just renewable power supply, but enabling demand response, backup power as a service and heat recovery as a service. This allows them to focus on what they do best, delivering 100% reliable energy. Combining this with new architecture and design in the building sector, collaboration between the energy and construction companies can easily deliver near zero, nearly zero energy buildings, NZEBs, with their own re renewable generation and taking full advantage of the surrounding energy system. This transforms the data center itself from a, from a <clears throat> excuse me, from a siloed operation to an integrated system of the wider energy landscape. Through collaboration, the data center operator can now become more sustainable while focusing on maximizing his own value creation, leaving energy and building infrastructure to the other industries. Digital businesses running on data centers need to take responsibility and collaborate with the digital infrastructure providers to link software together with its underlying resource and energy consumption. To conclude, as you've seen, the potential for collaboration across the digital infrastructure sector is vast and the roadmap facilitates this collaboration using the universal language of the sustainability metrics. So what does the future look like in which we have successfully created sustainable digital infrastructure? Well, in order to make significant progress by 2030, businesses and governments alike must rethink how they procure their own IT. The roadmap defines sustainability in, and its metrics. Now it's time to consider how those metrics, how, you, how we take action and compare those actions with the measurement metrics. For example, procuring IT services and infrastructure. Only then can we successfully reach our goal of truly sustainable digital infrastructure. A digital economic utopia. Now let's, let's just briefly travel back in time. When coal became radically cheaper, it kick-started the widespread adoption of steam and combustion engines. This led to the industrial revolution. Today, digital power is the new fuel that drives the, the economy, the engine room of the digital economy. Cheap and abundant digital power will trigger the digital industrial revolution. We are right at the beginning of it. And it's a, it's, an, it's a fantastic opportunity. We are facing the opportunity of a lifetime, building the digital infrastructure for our future digital economy. And with the technology and know-how available today, we can make the digital industrial revolution a sustainable industrial revolution. To finish off this presentation, I want to explain to you what it means to get to, to zero on our sustainability metrics. 
in terms of rare mineral consumption. Less minerals means less mining, means less child labor. In terms of CO2 production or CO2 equivalence production, well, we know cheap energy is the single most effective means to get people out of poverty. Digital infrastructure can support driving down the cost of energy and reduce pressure on the grid. It can also decouple fossil fuel growth from energy growth by being the integrator of renewable energy. And of course, on electronic waste, less waste is, means less landfill, less pollution, and more, more recycling means less mining and more efficient use of resources. Sustainability is possible. If you don't know what to do, go to our website and find out. We need everyone from energy to digital startups to work with us to create a truly sustainable digital future. So take this with you. Please go to sdialliance.org forward slash roadmap and find out where you can contribute with your products, your research and your support. Okay, that was uh, my pre-recorded presentation of our um, roadmap towards sustainable digital infrastructure by 2030. I'm sure a lot of you will want to see what it actually looks like. Um, so I will take the screen and hopefully you can see my screen. And what, Giuseppe, can you just confirm that you can see my yes. screen? Brilliant. Yes. Okay. So this is this is the sort of thing we're looking at. Like we said, these metrics, um, we identified these metrics, emissions, energy consumption, uh, electronic waste, and then resource consumption, later pollution and the cost of computer, co cost of digital power, but we haven't researched them so fully. Um, but these are the sort of five or six key metrics that are, I would say, the most important aspects of sustainability uh, in, the dig in digital infrastructure. Um, if you as we hover over to some of some of the uh activities remember the three three elements of the roadmap our universal metrics that go all the way through the supply chain so we're not just focusing on the data centers operational phase it's actually pre-operation and post-operation of the of the facility and then pre-operation operation and post-operation of the it and um Max might, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in his presentation up next. Um, but as we see, we've so these are just some of the activities and they're indexed to um, the sustainability, the sustainable development goals. Um, and as we can see, we can see who's contributing. Um, this is, these are specifically our members. So these are people that we obviously we know um, who are collaborate, collaborating on, um, on a lot of these sort of uh, items, a lot of these activities. So this is essentially what it looks like. Um, obviously, like I said in the presentation, this is the collaborative element. The activities are where members and non-members uh, collaborate um, to resolve or create certain uh, enabling, um, uh, uh, en enable certain activities that, that makes the industry more sustainable. Um, the really nice thing, I always come back to this, is that the universal metrics that we have so this goes all the way through the supply chain this allows us to see whether something is is actually working so the, it allows Mohan, us to yeah uh, I, I think it's not the right screen now because on your screen it's day three and day four so it's your google chrome page okay so well, I'll just okay. end the screen oh, it's not the right screen okay <laughs> um i wonder sharing and then show screen okay no the same how do i see how do we in sharing and then it's the same for videos but below what element of my screen can you see day four okay now lenovo Picture and your screen, your main screen. Uh, I don't understand. The main screen now with your icons and the Lenovo logo. Okay, so over here, is that better? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay. 
Okay, so it's a long screen. Okay, it's, it's fine. Um, so like I said, the uh, emissions, energy consumption, so the panel on the left is, is the metrics and they really go all the way through the supply chain. And the activities in the middle here um, are indexed towards some of our sustainable development goals. And this is where our members and actually non-members contribute and collaborate. So they, they pick up tasks. So this is, this is, this is the reason why the SDIA really was founded in the first place. It's to become the cat, the industry catalyst to make uh, sustainable change. Um, how do we find these emissions? Well, these were the key, sorry, emissions metrics. These metrics are what we identified as the most important ones for our industry. Um, like I said, em emissions, uh, energy consumption, resource consumption, and so on. Obviously, land use is not so impactful in our industry as it is in, say, our agriculture. So it's, it w the thing about sustainability is it's, it can never be like a 100% view. What we focused on is the really big items. So I want to open it up to um, questions from anyone uh, in the uh, from any of our attendees. I'm in the, the odd position where I normally moderate this section, so I normally ask the questions. So f please feel free to ask questions if uh, if you have any. Okay, a question from Neil Clark. How do you think small web agencies can get involved? So uh, there is a section here on, um, on software design. Um, Lena, Lena Architectures, design for software. Um, it, it's, it is a, a very important point, Neil. So, we tried to take into account, like I said, and Max will go into it later, those six key elements of uh, the life cycle of the entirety of, the, of digital infrastructure. And so these web, ag web agencies and, and, and software uh, applications, that layer is really important with respect to IT. Um, the question, how do you get involved? Um, you, can, you can obviously, uh, participate in some of the activities we put in there, there are about 20, but I suspect by this time next year, there'll be closer to 50. So you can also propose your own activities and, and start your own group, um, start your own research group. So to, to, to uh, create like a, a, a sort of working group on a specific activity that you might want. Um, question from Emma, what I'll do is I'll just unmute you because it's quite a long question. Um, so Giuseppe, if you want to unmute uh, Emma. Thanks, Giuseppe. It was only just about, and I'm sorry, I, I joined the session late because we had some internet issues which seem to be plaguing me this week. Um, but I wondered um, to what extent you've already covered, uh, you've covered uh, and linked your objectives to science-based targets, SBTs. Um, and whether you're defining them yet. And the reason was because in the I look after data centre operators and we're encouraging uh, them to link their sustainability priorities to meeting the science-based targets that have been set out for our sector. So I was just interested in comparing notes. Yeah, we, we haven't really indexed them to science-based targets. What we've what we've done, uh, our approach is not to index a target necessarily set by someone else, but it's to um, you could say index it based on uh, the priorities of that particular organization for either f finding an activity that they want to do or, or starting their own in this roadmap and then measuring it and reporting on it based on that universal measure those universal metrics and then you and then we can see whether they're 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 actually genuinely working or not um, so it's not um, indexed based on a third party's um, SBTs or necessarily STGs or not yet anyway. Um, but so it's more like a framework that you can get that people can self-assess themselves against and set their own targets. Yeah, yeah right. in a way self-assessment but also um, industry assessment, industry benchmarking. Um, it's important because because uh, and that's exactly it. The SDAA is the sort of the steward of the, fra of the framework. Um, it, it, it takes framework a little bit further though because the ac activities it's not just self-assessment because especially if, in terms of research and enabling a lot of things that need to happen um, 
you this is where you actually get directly involved as well so it's both the framework and um, uh, a collaborative tool great thanks yep that really explains it question from Neil um, let's unmute Neil and then he can ask his question So Neil, if you unmute yourself. Okay, excellent, sorry. Um, how do you plan to, to get the sort of critical mass of companies uh, and organizations on board? Like, what's the kind of, I suppose, the marketing plan for want of a better description that, that, that sits behind this roadmap? Because I think it, it looks great and, and um, just flicking around on it now, but um, yeah, the, the critical mass, I suppose, is the thing that, um, that, that, that really makes, sort of makes or breaks this. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so there's there are several things we're doing. Obviously, we've we've just launched it today, um, and we take it to a lot of um, industry experts to get a lot of feedback. Um, the first couple items on the roadmap you'll notice a digital carbon footprint, um, digital resource footprint, and so on. Um, begin the you could say formalizing the measurement and reporting uh, process, and for that we'll need a lot of people. So in order to, to build it, we'll actually build it or, or to, to continue on building on it, we need to get a lot of people involved. Um, and that that the idea behind that and, and the series of conferences also leading up until March, um, it, conferences way, raising awareness and then the roadmap actually getting people involved, we hope will steamroll into critical mass. But you're right, without critical mass, it, the, the collaborative element of this tool doesn't work so well. Um, so that, that is our aim. The other thing we noticed when we indexed it to the SDGs is that a lot of it is based on energy. A, a lot of our existing members are built around energy and very few are actually built around or uh, involved in the resource consumption element, so the sustainable resource consumption and so on. So that, um, so that's like you could say an, an extra element that we need to, to, in, to include um, before we get to critical mass that's something that became aware to us as we as we sort of indexed it to the SDGs yeah excellent thank you Mo. Um, okay any further questions maybe Mo I can ask one this yes please nice. um are people already working on these items? Yes, exactly. So particularly some of the um, items, if, if you can see my screen, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, Helio, Emperor, SIS11, for example, people that we know that in our membership, uh, within our membership who are working on some of these items. Um, there are, of course, many, many people who are working on it independently. Um, and that's, we think that's, kind of a waste of resources for everyone to do it so independently um, but to your point yes there are people working on this already and maybe to add, add from my side for for everyone who's listening i think it it is our um intent to use this also to bring everybody together onto a single um uh, platform and in the next step we will list all the ongoing research projects all the ongoing initiatives for each item so that there is one place where we can have an overview it, it took us a long time to put that together that overview so we want to share that with with everyone yeah exactly and that that's somewhat to some degree answers neil's point about critical mass it's trying to get everyone on this on this platform um next question here from emma fryer so i look after the uk operator community how could we best engage with you uh, this is a great question so so joining the roadmap um, and, and what we'll be doing in, in the next, I could say, few weeks and months, we'll be um, bringing out our sort of operator guide. Um, so how can you engage uh, with the roadmap? And there are, like I said, like we, we spoke about earlier, there are two levels. There's that reporting element um, and then there's the engagement with other members element. Um, and so that operator guide will come out shortly. Um, but in the meantime, please, please contact me. Um, and and we'll get started on engaging with it.
Okay. I think I think that's probably um, all the questions I've seen. There are um, maybe one comment I'm going to make is that we in, down here at the bottom we've included the cost of it says the cost of digital power. You could you could approximate that now as a cost of compute. That's more objective, um, but it's important that we are working with business and we're still continuing to drive down the cost of compute if sustainability incurs a cost and increases the cost of compute then actually that's not it's not good for the business environment because it's you entrench the, the bigger players um, and it's not good for the uh, larger technological environment because you prevent progress um, or you slow the progress so it's important and that that was a really key point that was a key metric that we that we included in there that we continue to reduce the price and therefore increase the accessibility of, of compute so with that I, uh, I don't see any more questions um, so with that I will close my side of the uh, presentation and I'll actually um, we'll get what we'll do is we'll, we'll break for 10 minutes because I don't want to start too Max's presentation too early um, because he's due to start in 15 minutes. So um, with that, uh, you know, please take a look at the roadmap. Um, we will be we will be consulting with with people. So please, please provide feedback. Um, and um, with that, I will uh, let's break for, for for 10 minutes and then we'll come back for uh, Max's presentation on uh, taking taking this a little bit further. He'll take it. He'll he'll look at sort of um, that first element there. So. So introducing a digital carbon footprint, uh, how to build it and, and, and why that would be incredibly beneficial. So that's up next.
Okay, uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we just had a last question popped in there from last session from Neil asking how we decided on the order of the terms in the roadmap. Um, it, this was more of this ha occurred through conversations with a lot of the members that we have who are working on it. The the important point is not so much where that item in the roadmap starts; it's actually where it ends. So you see a target with, when you hover over the roadmap, you see a target and you also see an endpoint. And that was something that most of our members fed back to us as important. It doesn't mean, that's not to say that that is the only interpretation of, of that. I mean, and, and that's one of the one of the, the collaborative elements of this roadmap is if, if you see it differently or if you propose it differently, then then you can make that proposal and, and change that endpoint and or that target um, or even that activity. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Neil. Basically, it was, you know, we need we need somewhere to start, a, a seed uh, that we need to put out there, and then from there we we will try and drive critical critical mass, exactly like you, like your question uh, implied. And to Emma, um, who asked the question earlier about SBTs, um, I just had a look. I couldn't see a, a, an SBT um, sector development roadmap for. The digital industry on the website maybe there is one i just couldn't find it um but the 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 the, the, the one of the um one of the things we wanted to avoid um was to be too inflexible um so data center we, we wanted to give operators and and companies and uh, suppliers and so on the flexibility to opt in and opt out of different items as they saw fit because a one-size-fits-all approach really just doesn't work and it could be quite um have quite a negative in influence if if we if we did go down a one size fits all route so this way work with with um companies that can opt in and opt out we give them the flexibility so that's um i hope that answers your your question on um operator involvement and why they might want to be involved it's obviously also very beneficial for uh, as as per the presentation uh, for regulators because um it, it, it would be useful for them to be able to see what measures are actually useful um, the, to, to measure the efficacy of certain items um, and to and even and before that to make uh, regulation um, based on proper data which I think sometimes they, they don't have so that brings the introduction to the roadmap to a close um, for me and what I'll be doing now is playing Max's presentation um, Max has been um, working on that that di digital footprint element. So that's one of the first steps for the SDIA to do is to say, okay, we know we want to measure emissions and energy consumption. How do we do that? And how do we validate that? How do we report it in a, in a, in a manner that, that can be validated? How do operators and, and um, suppliers and so on um, do it in a manner that can be validated and that is not um, too onerous? So I will play Max's presentation now. Welcome, everybody. First of all, I'd like to personally express my appreciation for all the great friends who are speaking during this conference. Thank you all for making this conference happen. More than 100 guests are joining us for the launch of our roadmap. We appreciate that you're here and we want to thank you for joining. So during this presentation, I'm going to shed some light on the first puzzle piece of our roadmap, a digital carbon footprint. So let's jump right in. The first question, why do we need a digital carbon footprint? If our roadmap is the universal language, the footprint allows us to see how far each industry has advanced in learning this new language and how well their products are speaking it. Change is not possible without data and the ability to track progress. The digital carbon footprint is the first sector-wide attempt to measure pollution, resource consumption, and carbon emissions. For the roadmap, the ability to track the impact of activities across these categories is a key success factor. This is why we need a comprehensive digital carbon footprint across industries and across the value chain. Now, 
let's talk about how to do it. You would probably start with the data center, since it's the heart of digital infrastructure, the engine room where everything comes together. However, this is a simplistic view. We don't just look at the engine of the car, we look at every component the car is made of, from the steel to the electronics, we look at the fuel and the manufacturing process. In fact, measuring within the data center is necessary, but limited. It's where the complexity of digital infrastructure just begins. Let me give you an illustrative example. In this picture, you see that the building owner might just lease square meters to a data center operator. That operator might just be dividing the space further and rent it to an IT service company. The IT service company might be managing IT hardware on behalf of the customer, but doesn't actually purchase it or build the application. The company purchasing from the IT service provider might not even know where the hardware or the data center is located. The IT team itself at the company does not know anything about the actual data center. For them, all the resources are virtualized. And so the complexity goes on. There are many participants in data centers, all disconnected from each other and all restricted from interfering with each other's business. At the end of the day, it's about availability of services. So mitigating any type of risk is part of the core business of each participant. So it does not help to simply look at the data center. We need to look at the entire value chain to track and measure progress towards the sustainability targets. As a simplified overview, we created a scorecard that transcends each value creation step, from the manufacturing of IT hardware, to operating it, to disposing it, and hopefully recycling it. Based on this, we can derive a pollution, resource, and carbon footprint, and further combine it into a single unified digital carbon footprint. But let's take this further, right? Creating the footprint involves gathering data from data centers, manufacturers, energy providers, recycling companies, and many others. We want to facilitate research, collaboration, and action. We're making this data available to anyone with the SDA Data Hub. Anonymized real-time, near-time, and time series data will become available over the course of the next quarter. This will create transparency on how we calculate the footprint and enable others to work with the data to drive improvements. Further, we will derive an industry benchmark for each part of the value chain, creating transparency across market participants on their progress towards sustainability. This will accelerate the transition towards a sustainable digital economy and the implementation of all roadmap across the sector. So let's conclude. We are creating the first comprehensive digital carbon footprint across all parts of the digital economy. It will make, as I like to say, the footprint of an Instagram photo measurable. It will create transparency. And most importantly, it will drive action. It's the first activity on our roadmap. And I would like to ask you to join us to make it happen. We need your help. Thank you, Max. Um, so that was uh, Max Schulze, uh, Executive Chairman for the SDIA, introducing that first item on the roadmap, which is, a, which is uh, developing and actually implementing uh, the digital carbon footprint. So Max, if you want to join us, um, perfect. And also everyone, please feel free to engage with, with questions, be as uh, difficult as possible. <laughs> um, so, Okay, I, I, I'd like to ask you, Max, how, and there's a similar question to, to Neil, what Neil asked earlier, how do we, how do we get um, critical mass? How do we get people to adopt this and implement it? I think um, as, a, as a starting point, I think there's, there's a lot of operators, there's a lot of companies in the market right now that are trying to differentiate themselves um, through sustainability. And I think um, to get started uh, using their data and, and their, using their willingness to share data with us um, will enable us to get started. 
and I think that that will be the first step um, to to yeah to to use the friends that we have that they just sent us we know um, that want to want to contribute to sustainability. Otherwise, we we know already it will otherwise be difficult to to get data um, in the market. Excellent. Um, and what happens then after that? So the 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 the, the Digital carbon footprint is is uh, is implemented. Um, it's widely uh, widely used. Uh, reporting begins. 2021 is a good year of reporting. What happens next? What happens next? Uh, it's a good question. Um, the so I think I think first of all, like getting all the getting all the data and. and, and from from what we know, will be the, the very first step, and it will be very challenging in itself because it has never done it has never been done before. Most of the data we currently see in the market is are, are yeah, mathematical models. They're they're a guess, not guesses, but they are estimates. Um, and we we aim to connect to the actual facilities and to the actual data sources in order to get uh, high quality real time or at least near time uh, data out of the systems. And I think. Once we have that data, building dashboards, building reporting uh, systems, and, and making that data as useful as humanly possible um, will be important. And one of the best uses that I can see is, is to track progress on our roadmap. So to to basically take the data, run calculations with it, and and uh, update our metrics, um, ideally as as live as possible. Right. So that's that was my my leading question. So eventually, the aim is to get it to real time reporting. Right. I think so. I, I, I'm, I'm a software engineer. For the people that don't know, um, I think it's complicated, and I don't want to say that that's a very, very high ambition. Um, but I think it's it's not impossible. And we're, if you look at our, our favorite piece of the puzzle, which is the data center at the core, it is a highly uh, technologized building in a way. Everything is monitored. Everything is auto or not automated, but everything at least goes into a central system often the building management system or the data center infrastructure management system, the DSIM. Um, and there is a lot of this information already available. So I I think not maybe not real time, but but near time data um, should be um, should be possible. And that should also be what we are aiming for as a as an industry industry. Perfect. We have a question here from uh, Neil. So I'll let Neil ask it himself. So if we unmute Neil Hey Max, um, yeah, hey. This, just to say this looks uh, this looks amazing. I'm really excited about this. Um, so, I was wondering, I suppose, again, it's a similar question uh, or uh, to, to what I asked uh, Mo before around around how, how do you sort of how do you want people to get involved? I, I'm thinking purely from my company's perspective around we're a relatively small web agency. Um, you know doing some carbon calculation stuff maybe, maybe that would be of use but what what other sort of big data gaps do you have that you need to fill most urgently and, and can we can we start putting people forward that we know for, for example um in the uk there's a um, a data center called the positive internet company that runs purely off of um, wind farm um sorry, wind energy up in cambridgeshire they sound like a perfect organization for, for for you guys to 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 maybe collaborate with so yeah is, it, is there any kind of uh, sort of plan for, for for that kind of um word of mouth marketing i suppose yeah i think there's so there, there's three components to this or three layers to this i would say and i'll start with the the, the end of your question where you, like from a from a marketing and publicity perspective i think there needs to be an awareness um, um for whoever is building software today or, or who's running on something on IT infrastructure, be it the cloud or be it some uh, dedicated server in a data center somewhere, um, to actually look at what you're buying and, and make sustainability part of that purchasing process or um, environmental friendliness. I think that's today not happening. If, if, if I would, we, we have actually surveyed some CIOs of very large companies and the, the, the main driver is cost and reliability. But we need to add a third component to that, which which is sustainability. And we will, um, as the SDA, very push very hard um, to change that mindset in in IT procurement. So I think that's the that's the top layer. Um, and I think on the on the software down to the hardware layer, I think 
currently there is um yeah you could say in my opinion there is a disconnect so so the software runs somewhere or the website runs on on a virtualized machine somewhere um, so there is a disconnect already to the actual physical hardware you don't know where you're running how much resources you're consuming um, except for storage maybe um, and there it would be wonderful if we could figure out a way how to make what we measure in the underlying data center somehow also visible on the website, be it with a little um, yeah, indicator or, or something that you see, in maybe not the real time, but maybe the average monthly environmental footprint of that asset, of that web asset. Um, I think that would be good as, again, as a differentiator for brands um, and as a, a means to think about it and, and to, to actually get that uh, information uh, connected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is, and we've got clients who are interested in 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 doing that and in displaying some kind of badge or or, or something along those lines. Um, but it's just the um, the thing that I get nervous about um, is that is that uh, ratio to say how do you convert the amount of data that's transferred into kilowatt hours, you know, and 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 what system boundaries are we using? And we just saying that that's the the it being pumped down the wire, which is quite low you know quite a, a low ratio or, or is it something where you take into the you know uh, m much like you were saying that kind of bigger picture of, of servers and embodied carbon and all of those kinds of things so yeah that um, that conversion figure is something that I I'm yet to find although I've got a personal um, uh, you know I, I personally buy into some of the some of the, some of the figures that are out there I, I don't know if some of our clients would would buy into them um, so yeah it's that that conversion figure that sort of data transfer to kilowatt hours is something that which which is like the game changer there um, and hence why I'm so excited about about this I think that's that there's a really really great point um, thank you for for bringing it up I think that the how to measure it has been a very open question for a really long time in the entire sector and that's why there, there's, there's has the sentiment now on a European level and on on in a lot of countries that data centers are in some way like they don't want to do it, or they, they don't want to report data, they don't want to show their environmental footprint. Um, and I think actually the opposite is the case. I think it's just, uh, it's a lot of engineers like me and we and, and you, and we realize that, oh, it's actually quite difficult to do this in the correct way. And if we can't do it in the correct way, we should be careful with what we're doing, because otherwise we might give away the wrong information or, or people get the wrong uh, perception and, and measuring the, the, the carbon uh, emissions along this entire stack of a software application down to um, the data center and down to the servers and the cooling systems, it's not trivial. And that's why we think it, it's time to take that on and that, that we do that together as an industry and figure it out. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. So question here from John Laban. Has there been much input from the team at the EU Code of Conduct for Data Centers? Um, thank you, John, for the question. I so there, there's there, there, there's, there's the there there's the certification element. Uh, I mean there is a lot of norms and standards in the data center space. Uh, the the new European norm, the EN, I always get the number wrong, so I won't even try. Um, and, and the whole certification piece. And I think the EU Code of Conduct for Data Center also tries to, to play into that uh, direction. I think we, we do not intend at the moment the roadmap to be a means of certification. Um, I think the, the EU Code of Conduct for Data Centers goes hand in hand with it. And we will um, look rather which certifications can positively contribute uh, to the progress of our roadmap. Um, of course, uh, personally, John Booth, um, we, we really appreciate his input. We try to get his input on, on many things, and we are in constant dialogue uh, also with Green IT Amsterdam. Um, and I think, yeah, we, we try, we seek input all the time as from as many people as humanly possible, to be honest, because we can't do it alone. That, that, that's why we set up the SCA if, if, yeah, to, to, to drive collaboration. And I know, uh, for example, on, on that, the EU Code of Conduct is voluntary reporting, but in, to, to some degree similar to what we're trying to set up here, but, but we have that element of we're a collaborative tool as well. So you, it, it's, it's, it, it, it fosters, you're more likely, to, I, I would say, to report um, using our tool than, than that, but, but they are complementary tools. Um, next question here from Carl. So I'll 
unmute Carl so you can ask your question on virtualization. If he's still there, I don't think he's there. Okay, I'll ask a question. Question, are the increasing layers of virtualization making it harder or easier for you to track carbon in an application? This is a very deep software engineering question. Um, I can try to answer it in, I, I actually, so that, that there's two parts to this question, right? The first question is, are there really more virtualization layers now? And I would say it's actually reducing and uh, I can give a shout because he's here to, to John, um, John Laban from OCP. I think if, if we look at the future of, of hardware, if we look at the OCP equipment, we already see that, for example, there's actually less virtualization layers. There's, for example, Kubernetes running directly on the hardware, which, which in my opinion, makes it easier. Um, generally, virtualization is not bad. I think what has been challenging in the past, especially on the measuring uh, item, and now I hope I don't get too technical, is that a, a virtual machine in itself blocks resources that it might not need. Right, so you 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 might have the perception that your system is full, um, or your system is at limit because all memory is reserved, all CPU power is reserved, um, but actually within the virtual machines there's nothing happening; it's idling. And a lot of virtualization tools have, or, or software infrastructure solutions, have tried to already deal with this. And I think the most impressive uh, one, however, is is what we can do now with containers and and Kubernetes in terms of efficiency. Um, and I think that those layers actually contribute a lot to, to making it more efficient. I, I wouldn't say they make it harder to, to track it. I would just, I, I would say they're generally contributing. I mean, virtualization was the, one of the single most efficient ways to drive up um, data center and IT efficiency in the last, I would say 10, 15 years. Um, and driving that to the absolute limit should be our ambition anyways. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Wonder if we have any more questions. I think while I'm always waiting for a question, what one thing that I want to say, I, I, because we we do get a lot of the feedback that that we our ambitions are very high, and they are because I I personally believe that. When, there is, when it comes to sustainability, our, all our ambitions worldwide should be very high. And we should ideally overshoot the targets that we have set um, to mitigate other industries not um, being able to. And one of the reasons why this, this measuring and, and footprint um, uh, topic is so important to us is because I honestly think that digital, the digital economy, the digital industry in itself, or be it startups, companies, uh, infrastructure providers, um, can actually be a leader in transforming society into into a sustainable um, into a sustainable economy into a sustainable society um, for the future, and I I, I really want to measure it and I want to show the world how digital technology can affect positive change and how it can transform itself to be basically resource and energy neutral to 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 a certain extent and really lead the way uh, because I don't think that. Other industries that are that are not so technology driven take steel, take um, take cars. Um, it will take them much longer. It will be much harder for them, and they they are not as they don't have that many tools and, and and possibilities in place like like the digital economy does. And I that's why I think this footprint is important, so we can show that we can be in the lead. And that's um, and that's something you mentioned in your presentation there about actually. The, the data center operator is important, but there are actually many more pieces in the chain. Yeah. Um, and that's, a, I, I would say, probably another, um, a, a very different perspective from a lot of the metrics, a lot of the, uh, what people call efficiencies and uh, often like EU code of conduct, what it focuses on. A lot of that is focused on the, specifically the data center operator and ignores this huge chain. Um, and that requires us, like Neil was saying, to then make huge extrapolations to guess the impact um, so this actually brings it all under one roof. So, there is a, another question from John here, which is a, a very good one. John, thank you. Uh, does digital truly de dematerialize the physical world? I don't think so at all. I think it, it, it's more um, 
yeah, how do you say in English? Uh, it, it makes it better. Um, it makes the physical world better. I think what we are trying to say often in in the SDA is we want to create an we want to create economic growth um, without consuming natural resources. So by so making the physical world better with technology, without that that is not destroying the environment at the same time or, or using natural resources from or extracting natural resources from the environment. And I I think that the digital economy really can pull that off. I mean. Where else can you turn essentially your knowledge or your expertise into money? It's, it, it works on the internet. Um, and for you, often as the business owner or as the consumer or wh whoever you are, you don't see that there is an environmental or resource footprint attached to that. Um, but in, in, in principle, and if we really look at the, 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 what Mo uh, calls the, the, uh, the paradise state or the, this, this perfect future, I think the, the digital economy can be the first one where, where we can create economic growth without yeah, burning oil, and to be very practical, and, and burning coal. I hope that answers oh, uh, the question. We get very I, I, philosophical. <laughs> I have a question for you there, Max. So often we, we all talk about a lot of the, how we don't see um, when we talk about scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, we don't see all of the applications that have moved from a paper world or physical world to into the data center. And there's obviously a, a huge efficiency improvement from doing that, right? In terms of resource consumption and energy um, consumption and uh, emissions production. Um, so a lot of that has been in, involved in making analog or manual applications digital. What about this next? raft of applications right the digital industrial revolution where these are digital only applications how will that affect consumption is there you see a re a rebound effect coming and if so does that underline the importance of getting these metrics in now yeah i, I think you already know the answer to that question Mo. <laughs> um absolutely i think the the more we are now on the brink of the next level of the of, of power of digital technologies while at the same time seeing that the 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 performance that we can get out of each piece of hardware is kind of stagnating so we we're, it's, it's plateauing um so we believe and i think that's why the timing um for, for us to to do this now is really important because we are on the verge of the next era in in computing um i think over the last years, uh, things like autonomous driving, AI, they've been, you know, piped up and down the uh, street nonstop. Um, and I think there was always the question, like, how real is that right now? And I think it's becoming more real in the next one or two years. And now is the time to um, to have the tools in place to make sure that these systems and these new technologies can grow in a sustainable way and not become, um, yeah, the downfall of the digital economy. In, from an environmental sense. Interesting. And uh, last call for any more questions, just while we're waiting for some questions. Uh, in the handout section, there are the slides um, in PDF form. So please feel free to download all of the slides and um, there is contact information on there and all sorts of links on there. So please feel free. Just a reminder also that um, the videos, the slides, will be available on Sustainable Places website and our website after the event. Um, so that, that includes also the, a lot of this, the Q&A session. Um, so please feel free to, to, to download as much of that as possible. John is asking another question. I think uh, he has a lot mm. of questions on his mind. Um, I'll read it. Uh, how important will be the will the prosumer be to this transformation to sustainability? It's an interesting question because I, I've never really thought about the word prosumer in the, um, in the digital world. I think in the energy world, it's a quite common term for somebody who has their own uh, energy infrastructure in their house um, and is at the same time consuming from the grid. Um, I think 
So in, in, in digital, when I think about this and I just answer now the way it comes to my mind, um, the prosumer are software engineers because um, in my opinion, they, they and we, so since I'm a software engineer myself, we are agents of change because most of the time we try things out in our own personal life or private time and with our own code and applications. And we, we test out new services. I, I remember when, when Heroku became really big uh, in the beginning of AWS because mostly developers were playing with it. Um, and then they bring it to their job. So they might work in a big corporate, they might work in a, work in a startup and they bring that technology, they bring those technology choices, also hosting choices to Neil's point earlier. Um, they bring that to the company. And I think they are the prosumers. So IT software developers hold the key to making these choices. Because let's be honest, the CEO of, of Siemens will not tell the software engineers, you know, which hosting environment they're going to use or how they're going to uh, configure their servers. That's all up to the developers. And I think they will be the ones that will eventually have to drive the change. And they have always been driving change, um, be it different technologies, be it different types of infrastructure solutions. Um, they are the key influencers, in my opinion, and we don't talk about them or talk to them enough still, I would say. We talk a lot about data centers who are on the receiving end of their service providers. They just, they do what they're told in a, in a way to, to a certain extent. Um, and it's the, the IT infrastructure guys, the, the software developers that are actually making the choices and setting the requirements. And this is simplified. There's a lot of people in between. There's a lot of other challenges in between, but in a nutshell, uh, to answer your question, John, I, I think they will be extremely important. Now, maybe uh, Max, if I can ask you some more generic questions on the SDIA. So the, dir the direction of the SDIA, um, the membership, where are you looking for new members? Everywhere, I think. <laughs> no, I, I think you, as you said in the roadmap, so, so bringing as many companies as possible together to make it happen, that's always been our ambition and bringing them together across the entire value chain of digital infrastructure. That's always been our, our goal. I think at the moment, it's very important for us to get, um, to bring together, first of all, the energy sector and the digital infrastructure sector. And on the, on the front end, so to say, is to bring, um, more IT uh, partners, CIOs, software developers, the ones we just talked about um, to the SCA and get these two groups really collaborating with each other, figuring out how they can change the way they do business together um, and, and, and changing those relationships a bit. Uh, so we're looking mainly yeah, into IT and into energy at the moment um, to recruit more members um, and to, to bring more people to collaborate on the roadmap. Okay, I think that's probably all the questions we, all the questions that, oh, no, we have another question from Neil. And John. <laughs> There's a new, a new ish image format called AVIF. It isn't universally supported yet, but innovation like this is hugely important. How can we as an industry make sure innovation like this keeps getting funding for fast tracking? So AVIF, new innovation, but not so well adopted. How do we, how do we make people adopt it quicker? Mm -hmm. I think so. There, there, there's. Um, I would. Sorry, it's a complicated question, but I, I, I do my best. I think there's the two, two, two ways to look at this. Again, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm just assuming now that this is a that this. Um, Algorithm is, is better at compressing images or this format is better at, at uh, making it smaller or better to transfer that there's some improvement. And I, I think it's often difficult to quantify the economics of these kind of like, what, how much money do we save when we, when we reduce it by 10 kilobytes? And I think a lot of that can be solved by measuring the environmental impact of, of, of data transfer, what you mentioned earlier, or storage or computational power because that often literally translates into, into the underlying cost. Um, so I think 
how can we get them to be adopted faster by measuring them in the right way, I think, that, and, and making the, the, the resulting numbers transparently and openly available to everybody, and, and how to get them funded. Um, I think there needs to be a stronger emphasis, and that's also something we're working on with the STA. Um, the, the government is one of the roles of the government is to 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 basically um, finance this research gap often in technology um, or the scale gap. So getting buying the first million, so we you, you the consumer can buy the second billion cheaper. Um, and I think when it comes to digital technologies in Europe and and technologies that could make the digital economy more sustainable, I think there is a enormous lack of uh, attention for that. I think there's everybody's talking about it, digitalization, green future, green new, new green deal, but in terms of actual funding available to to these kind of endeavors or what to fund is a big black unknown spot. Um, and again, something some of the reasons some of the reasoning you see now why we um, why we made the roadmap because we want to say, look, this is the stuff we need to reach. Here are some technologies, here are solutions uh, on our roadmap that require funding that are needed, that require further research. Um, and then we make that happen. And, and that's that's also part of the journey because without money, um, most of these technologies uh, near your right uh, will probably not make it. Either, they either need to perform really well or they need to be funded through through that initial initial hump. All things um, we will um, work on through the roadmap as well. Um, and I'll pick up John's question here from the chat. Um, I think it's a it's a follow up question to to what you asked earlier. Um, how aware are software engineers of the energy impact? <laughs> I would say not at all. And I I think there's there was an interesting uh, conversation that Mo and I had that I I want to bring here with the uh, I think it was the head of sustainability for ARM, a chip maker. Um, or one of the lead uh, scientists in, in their team. And he was saying, well, on a phone, if we build software for a phone, of course we care about the energy efficiency because the, the battery drains, um, but everywhere else, and, and to a certain extent, even on a, on a laptop now, uh, but on, on servers, no, we just, we maximize performance. We just, we assume this machine is always running and has unlimited uh, power and unlimited energy. And there's also, at least to my knowledge in, in, in software and in, in building what's called backend applications so that run on a server, there is no measure of, of energy uh, at all. There's just uh, performance measures and those are often not linked to, to energy at all. Yeah, exactly. That's he, he, what he said was quite interesting with, with the mobile phone, the energy in, that it could consume is, is a constraint so you work around, you work backward, you create that energy consumption constraint because your mobile phone can't get bigger, your battery can't get bigger. And then you work backwards from that and you optimize everything else. And with the data center environment, we don't do that because we can we can grow or we can, uh, so we, we, don't, we don't start with that as an engineering constraint. So that might lead into your question, John, about how aware, well, how aware are software engineers, but whether they're aware or not, they don't have that constraint. They're often given different engineering constraints, which they just pass up the chain. I wonder if Neil Clark wants to have to answer, try and answer John LeBan's question there. How aware are software engineers of energy impact? So Neil, I'm, I want to unmute you and see if you can, if you have anything interesting to say. I know you're a software engineer who's interested in this space. Hey, so I'm not. Um, thanks, Mo. I'm not actually a software engineer myself, but um, but I, yeah, I work. The agency that I work for has a bunch of software engineers, and I, and I try to, I suppose, give a bit of a rallying cry to, to those guys, and 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 try to um, encourage them to, to to think about it. And and I suppose my experience of having done this with a few clients and also our internal teams is that the answer is not very aware um, um, on on the whole. Um, but that's not that's not um, that's not their fault that's not to say oh of course they should be uh, aware of it you know there is a distinct lack of, of, of awareness of the impact the environmental impact of the digital industry um, but they are um, 
I, I would argue they're not given time to, to care about it. That, that, that I think is, is my main kind of uh, issue, issue on it. So when you start a project, you have a, pro, you know, a new website project, for example, because that's what I mostly deal in. Um, you have a budget of, you know, a hundred thousand pound or whatever it might be. Um, you, you aren't given a carbon budget, you know, you, you, that's not at the same level. So, so the, the engineers are not, are not given that time. They're not given that uh, constraint or that or that um, yeah that budget or that incentive whichever way you want to look at it to care about um, uh, carbon emissions of, of, of what they're doing and, and and the software that they're writing so I think they I think it's I think it's um, it's definitely something we need to address from an industry perspective I would love us to start doing some stuff in 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 universities and schools to start raising the awareness but it's also a cultural change thing within the digital industry when we're building projects um, well, so when we're building sites or putting projects together to have um, budgets and, and, and to push our development teams and to um, allow them room and, and, and time uh, and, and you know headspace to go and investigate the latest things that they can do rather than just saying this is the budget hit that at all costs this is the date um, which is what I you know which is really what we tend to do at the moment. I think to, to add to that, Neil, that, that that's a really good observation. I think time uh, is absolutely there's uh, in my experience from from uh, when I worked as an engineer, there was never this question um, on 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 how much how can we reduce the the impact, the impact. or environmental uh, balance of of an application. Um, in all fairness, I think there was an initiative by the German government or an idea from the German government to actually rate all the libraries on GitHub for, for different software um, based on their carbon intensity in, in theory. So the size of the software package and then how much computing capacity that could theoretically co consume. I think those kind of things would also help make, make right choices because today, today, if I really think about choosing components to build software, I would not know which component is the better choice in terms of environmental friendliness that just doesn't exist yeah so there, there's a lot of blocks i think that need to be addressed and I, another op, a second observation that i think is food for thought for everybody is that software has evolved to an extent or software engineers also as a person that we don't actually deal with the infrastructure anymore right so the the, the latest the, the state of the art is we package our applications in docker containers as lean as possible as slim as possible uh, and we throw them into a gigantic uh, cluster um, and the cluster will automatically, magically replicate it, duplicate it, scale it up, scale it down based on what's happening. Um, so in, in a way, that could be a good thing because that, that system is more, probably much better at optimizing our, the, the efficiency of applications than, than we are. Uh, but at the same time, we also give up a certain sense of control and there's no transparency into the into that cluster, um, which could be um, could be dangerous. I, I have no answer to that either, but I think there's a lot of new technologies on the horizon that could make this much better, this this transparency and and efficiency in in, in software applications. And there's a lot of risks that it could get worse. That, that's to be seen. But the technology, in my opinion, is there. It has been there for quite some time. Question here from John LeBan. This is a quite difficult one to answer, I think. Will all these energy considerations disappear with quantum computing? Will all these energy <laughs> will all these energy considerations dis disappear with quantum computing? Well, first of all, every encryption that you today believe in will disappear with quantum computing. So that will all be cracked in seconds then. Um, I don't I, I honestly don't know. I, I think so. The, the state of quantum computers is, is, is similar as AI, a topic that's often talked about, yet we are yet to see a, a stable desktop quantum computer. And I think we are further away from that than a lot of people want to be. Uh, I know there's a lot of money flowing from the big tech companies into, to, into trying to make that work. Um, I honestly don't know. From what I know about quantum computers, they, are, they won't be good for every use case anyway. So we will still have standard compute and quantum compute. Uh, but I think from a data center perspective, yeah, it could lead to an enormous shift in, in theory. But as Mo always taught me from history, that whenever um, yeah, something got 
uh, got cheaper or, or, or more energy efficient, people didn't start consuming less or, or consumption did plateau, but actually it then goes through the roof because then everybody says, well, now we don't have to worry about it anymore. And I think that's what happened with digitalization in the first place. Um, it doesn't matter what the footprint is because it's so efficient, it's so little. Uh, and then we scale it to a level where all of a sudden at scale, it, it, it does have an impact again, uh, which I think is exactly what happened with, with digital applications. Nobody thought about it. Everybody just assumed digitalization is better. It's better than anything else. So let's just do it with software and software is better. And software has no footprint and no negative impact on anything. And now I think we're realizing and the same could happen to a quantum computer that um, there is an impact always at scale. It's like my mother told me, if you eat too much of one thing, you get sick. <laughs> and that's that, that's a scale effect. Um, John's comment there to that was, yeah, Yevon's paradox doesn't apply today. I wonder, uh, John, if you want to unmute yourself and then have a, a little talk about Yevon's paradox. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's called uh, Chevin's Paradox, and it's the idea, he was a guy, um, when did he live, 100, um, between 100 and 200 years ago, when uh, coal mining brought the coal out of the ground so cheaply, um, and the price just collapsed, and what he worked out was there was just this huge consumption. Um, I don't believe that is the economic model in the future, as we move into the future, as being not about stuff, about information and I think it's uh, it doesn't apply in the same way and I think that's a very interesting discussion to have with a group of economists because you've got these um, these new radical economists that are saying no it doesn't apply it doesn't apply anymore and then you've got the traditionalist economists that are saying yes it does apply it does apply and I think unless we get the economics right we're not going to get these transformations yeah, and I, I think it's the this is generally also, and again, now we really get into economics, is this paradox of like will infinite infinite growth be possible, right? And and is that desirable and will the future really look like that? Um, based on the the old economic models of of continuous endless growth. Um, and is that necessary to to a certain extent? Um yeah, I, I think there's a lot of unanswered question, but I think it's it's time we look at software and digitalization and, and digital in general as its own economy because then we can also develop new models of how to talk and think about it as an economy uh, in itself rather than just saying well that's that software or that startups or, or whatever we call it today i don't think we we really think about it as its own industry or its own economy uh, by itself with its own dynamics so this is a perfect point to transition max out and transition John in. John is our next speaker. So Max, I'll just give you 20 seconds to say your final piece, say your thank yous and, and where people can um, access more information and, and join up to the to the roadmap and to the digital carbon footprint before I bring in John. Yeah, I actually just want to say thank you for all the amazing questions. I really enjoy these conversations with, with all of you um, and I, I hope that we can have many more with the roadmap as, as our guiding uh, guiding instrument to know what we need to talk about. So, because we can all go off very far um, and the roadmap should anchor us a little bit and that these conversations can eventually lead to amazing projects, um, amazing technologies and solutions to bringing digital infrastructure into a sustainable future. Um, I think we can do it, especially all the people in the room now and, and, and um, all the people we are working with the SCA, there's many more people joining uh, joining us every month. And I, it makes me happy to see how the entire technology sector is rallying behind this. Um, and I, I think we can be the leaders in the space and we should be. Thank you, Max. And now introducing, introducing John. Um, John works at the Open Compute Foundation um, where they're doing a lot of um, standardization in computation and he also is involved in the i want to say is it the open network foundation which is the fiber equivalent but i'll let john introduce himself and talk about what he's doing and and where they're going if john is there yeah i'm here yes um yes what do i do i help out the um the open source communities so I've been working with um, 
to try and get my video on if it'll come on. There we are. Um, I help out the Open Compute Project, that's open source hardware, but I also help a new organisation that started in the UK called Open UK. And what we're trying to do is do what um, Max has been talking about all the time, bring together the synergies of the free opens. That's open hardware, open software and open data. And if you can bring those together, the potential uh, for efficiencies is considerable. So that's my passion. And uh, disruptive economics, the listening to the new uh, economists, which absolutely fascinates me for the, the future of, um, of the planet and how it needs to connect with the concept of sustainability. Excellent. And you'll be talking today um, about uh, data center carbon footprints and how to decarbonize through innovations. I presume specifically about that open source innovation. Um, yes. The, the big question I'm asking is, and I've had lots of chats with Max, um, why are we not measuring holistically carbon footprints? And in particular, my focus is on scope free and why do I kind of, I know quite a bit about scope free now because my wife is the sustainability uh, planner for the City of London. And just this month, they issued a report measuring the carbon footprint for the City of London Corporation and scope free was 96%. Mm. And that just blew my head off. And I'm thinking, what is it for the data center industry? <laughs> and I just don't know. I've got no idea. Oh yeah, that's it. Excellent. Um, that yeah, that's exactly our was our motivation as well. So our interests are very aligned there. Um, I will start now with your presentation. Um, so if you want to mute yourself and uh, turn your webcam off, and that way the camera doesn't get confused. Hi, this is John LeBan. Um, my call to action is to measure holistically data center carbon footprints and followed by data center decarbonization actions um, based in the 21st century open source collaborative commons and its associated circular economy. This is the agenda I'm gonna cover. And I just want to run through initially the scope two and three relationships. Um, I also want to talk about uh, the concept of being slaves to the economist models. And I'll touch on the 21st century embedded economy. I'd also like to kill the myth that being green costs more money. Also, open source ICT hardware is well rotted horseshit for growing the circular economy, the importance of open source for circular economy hardware. And yes, to talk about the way open source software um, eats hardware by about 90%. And I'll give you some examples of that. So data center CO2 emissions, if you don't measure them, then you can't improve them. Um, I could be wrong, but um, what do you think? Uh, I don't think people are really measuring holistically CO2 emissions. Now, this is the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which has been around for nearly 20 years, and it tells you how to do that. I've assumed that uh, people are familiar with what scope one, two and three is. Now, what I wanna try and show is the importance of scope three. Now this here is the City of London Corporation generated their climate action strategy this month. You can go and download it from that uh, link at the bottom. 
And when you have a look in there, you'll find that their scope free is 96%, 96%. When you look at the greenhouse gas protocol, the studies they've done on business sectors around the world, and they've found that scope free accounts for more than 80% in each sector, a business in each sector. Now let's look at uh, data centers. I've got uh, two pie charts there. I've got A on the left and it's showing scope free as 20% and I've got on the right, I've got B and I've got scope free accounting for more than 80%. Now the question I'd like to ask is which pie chart is nearer to reality for a data center in Europe? Now there's very few people that can answer this because basically people are not measuring these carbon footprints holistically. I will explain. One thing that you need to be aware of as a scope two, that's the, the carbon intensity of electricity, as that reduces to zero as we move into renewables, scope three emissions will start to move up to 100%. Now here's a, a photograph of a wooden, wooden data center facility in Sweden, Eco Data Center. Thanks for the photo. Um, here in the, um, the picture is a chap called Lars. And if you want to know about the impact on scope three in terms of the data center building, then go and talk to this chap because he really is considering scope free within their infrastructure. And by the way, Lars is not a data center expert. And I think one of the reasons why they're doing these radical things is because they're not set in the old ways that data center experts normally are. So my call to action is for the data center industry to start measuring holistic CO2 emissions and don't forget the scope free. The scope free will become more and more important as we move through this decade. Now, what's going to drive this? What's going to drive it is John Maynard Keynes stated that practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And I think we're all going to be slaves to the new economic models that are coming through. Let's have a look at uh, gender economics in the 21st century. Notice the ones that are changing the scene are women. They're turning traditional economics on its head. And they're coming up with these 21st century embedded economy models. Now, this is where it's really radical from the old ways of doing economics, but you can see it's embedded because it's embedded in the earth, this finite resource. And from that, you've then got society and economy, those three fundamentally making up sustainable systems. You can see the inputs, solar energy coming in, heat out. But right at the core there, you can see the commons. Now, this is the open source technology collaborative commons that sits within this new embedded economy model. Now you may have heard about the European Union's Green Deal. This is the president and she did um, some really big keynotes at uh, Davos this year and she talks about this transformation of the old economy to the new economy. Now the Green Deal is fundamentally based on the 21st century embedded economy model. So if you don't know about it, I'd recommend you start to learn about it because it's going to impact you as you move forward in time through this decade. There's going to be legislation coming in from the European Union and it's not just going to 
uh, be concerned by those within the European community. If you want to do business with the Europeans, you will have to fall in to compliance on these climate laws they're bringing in. And one of them, which I think is going to be profound, is the EU border tax. And basically, it's when you bring physical products into the European Union, you cross the border, there will be tariffs laid on these products due to how much scope free CO2 there is, i.e. embedded carbon inside the product. Also, the idea of this collaborative commons that's um, starting is uh, EU public money and open source technology policies. This is a call for tenders to study the impact of open source software and hardware on technological independence and competitiveness and innovation in the UK con in the EU economy. And this is a research project that will lead towards policy decisions that if uh, public money is being spent, the technology that it's spent on needs to be open source software and hardware in the ICT field. This here is a wonderful video that you can look at later. Hopefully you'll get access to all these slides. And if you go to that YouTube link, you can play this short video, it's a few minutes, and it will give you the background and the arguments why EU public money will lead towards uh, policies on open source technology purchases. Now trying to kill the myth about uh, being green costs more. This chap here, Jamie Lerner, he's actually a, a town planner in South America. I love what he says here. If you want creativity, take a zero off your budget. If you want sustainability, take off two zeros. Now let's give you some examples of, by looking at decarbonisation, you financially reduce your financial costs in your data centre environment. Now what we have here is a slide that was developed by a Dutch consultant when he discovered open source technologies. And he described it as a hidden revolution he became aware of it in around about 2017, 18. And he was just dumbstruck by the efficiencies in data centers driven by open source that was fundamentally driven by the users of the technology, not by the vendors, the providers, it was driven by the, the users. And there you've got a comparison in terms of efficiency between open source, the OCP, and the traditional standards and uh, that the industry has been using now for the past 20, 30 years. Just a few of the things where there's improvements, the typical server, um, at low utilization, uh, an open source server using 50% less energy. Another thing I wanna to touch on, users driving open source tech hardware. They're trying to remove what's called uh, gratuitous product differentiation. They're trying to simplify everything. And here we have a basic system of a computer server power supply unit you see it as a black box in the middle. And fundamentally what it does, it takes mains AC inputs, alternating current inputs, and it gives you a 12 volt direct current output. Fundamentally, that's what it does. So at the bottom there, why do we need hundreds of different incompatible power supply units? Let's show you a few. If you go on Google and just do a, a Google search in images, for um, server power supplies, you will get hundreds and hundreds of power supplies for servers, all completely differentiated from each other, gratuitously differentiated from each other, so they can't be used between machines, even within the same vendors. 
Now, here's an example of what um, the open source community did, driven by the consumers of the technologies, is here's a, a vanity free open source server. This is typically what's used by the hyperscalers, the telcos now. Uh, governments are moving into it and enterprises are sliding into it. But there are no power supplies inside this server. No power supplies, no graphic units, no bezels. You wouldn't know who made it. Um, and there's a lot more removed as well. That's why we call it vanity free. And this is open technology driven by the consumer of the hardware. We have vendor driven close my optic design mindset. What's their motivations? They want to build in obsolescence, three to five years sweet spot. Gratuitous product differentiation, power supplies. Closed proprietary user lock-in. Here we have Cisco routers and software. Monolithic integration, basically tying together the hardware and the software with proprietary hardware and software in order to uh, lock in that um, user into that vendor's solution. And it also includes proprietary firmware. And if a, a vendor decides he's not going to support that firmware anymore, then effectively you can't use the hardware. Now, prosumer-driven open source design is about dematerialization. They're not there to be making more stuff like a vendor. They're there to use as little as possible <clears throat> to do a, a function, a job. Um, so they're very motivated to reduce stuff. And with open source software, I'll give you some examples of how it reduces the physical hardware in the data center and eats the data center itself is very simple. Just here, we've got open source firmware and we've got the right to repair. Now, if we're gonna keep things for as long as possible at the highest possible utility, we need the right to repair. Other things, unbundling, unbundling the software and the hardware, disaggregation, we call it. To give more freedom to the users to hack the solutions, to maintain the hardware longer in a useful mode. Now here, there's a, a excellent um, YouTube presentation. It's by the CTO of Comcast talking about applying open source tech to a data center in Atlanta. And here he tells a story about uh, why they did it. And on the left hand picture, you have the before picture. This is the proprietary picture. You've got 10 racks. And that's all replaced by one rack on the right. The open tech virtualized solution. Now, this is a prime example of how open source tech and software just eats the hardware. And this is why the telcos are going to move into this. It has a huge impact on their cost base. Um, the open source community, OCP, started this circular economy just over a year ago. It's really starting to fly. You'll hear other people talking in this um, seminar event that we're running at the moment with SDIA. You'll hear people from a company called IT Renew and others talking about how they're basically repurposing open source hardware um, from the hyperscalers so that it keeps being used longer in other users' data centers. One good example of this is a company, new startup in Holland called Block Heating. On the top left-hand side there, you've got uh, the founder, 
Jerome. And what they basically do in they're taking air cooled OCP servers and they're hacking them and converting them to liquid, to water, water cooled. And then what they do, they take the water from the from the server at 63 degrees and they feed it into greenhouses and it's used for growing tomatoes, cucumbers and peppers. But the other benefit from this, it substantially reduces the cost and block heating um, will be selling their cloud services that will be running inside these um, modular data centers associated with warming greenhouses. Uh, they'll be selling their services substantially lower than the others that are not getting the benefit of this kind of secondary reuse of heat. Another company that's doing a lot in this respect is a company called OVH. They're a, a French company. Uh, here you've got the, uh, the CTO, Octave Klaber, one of the founders. And I just love their philosophy. The philosophy is, let's just reuse. When they build a data center, they don't build a new data center. They go and find a, an old industrial unit in a business park somewhere. It's got the power. And they just basically recondition that building. And then into that building, they put these servers. What you can see there are racks of OCP servers that were when they were in Facebook air cooled. And here they are now converted uh, for liquid. And as a result, they massively reduce the cost of the infrastructure for the data center by simplifying the way the server has its heat taken off with water. And you could probably build four data center facilities for the price of a traditional enterprise tier three. And this is actually happening in Sweden with other companies, not just OVH. But the cost model is being massively disrupted. Now, because OVH are doing this, you can see here, these are prices of um, costs for virtual machines across cloud service providers. And here you've got OVH in blue. You can see them lowest cost right at the bottom. Look where Amazon is. Now Amazon's got scale, but they're not doing this innovation on circular economy and a focus on truly open systems with you know, a minimization of stuff, an obsession of a minimization of stuff like OVH are doing. So it gives them a competitive edge, they get an environmental business advantage. And lastly, here we've got Larry Ellison. <clears throat> now he's the founder of Oracle. Uh, and I love this. Once open source gets good enough, competing with it would be insane. And I believe that uh, open source technology has got good enough in the last decade. And we're going to see some very disruptive times during this decade as people take the advantages of these technologies into data centers. And it will be a very interesting time ahead. So thanks for listening. Now it's question time and um, Looking forward to some questions coming through. Thank you, John, for that presentation. Um, I have a question before the audience begins with their question. What do you mean when you when you say software eats hardware? Um, what does it do? Let's give you an example of how software would eat hardware. Um, if you looked at a traditional enterprise data center that uh, was using servers that weren't virtualized, you'd probably see uh, utilization of the server at six to 12 percent. 
Now, what these uh, virtualization softwares do, like uh, Linux containers and the orchestration uh, packages like Kubernetes, they enable much more work to be done on a single piece of tin. And so instead of running at like 10% utilization, you can bump that up to more than 50%. Now, consequently, what that does, it re removes the requirement for the physical servers that were running at low utilization because you're optimizing, you get more work from each one. And there's some really good uh, presentations that are kind of hidden away on the on YouTube. And there's a one I'd really recommend. It was done by uh, he's a, an English guy working for Deutsche Bank. And he talks about the when Deutsche Bank implemented open source containerization systems, they and Deutsche Bank had between 100 and 200,000 physical servers in their infrastructure. And this software reduced their server count so that in the end they were running over 80% of all their applications on just 20% of their server base. Now that's how profound it is. Um, and it's all about making stuff work more efficiently. And I believe this is not just going to happen in uh, in data centers this is going to happen with cars as well and once we start to share cars and we have uh, autonomous robotic cars and we start utilizing them more efficiently predictions to the future on car manufacturing is that the car manufacturing compared to today will collapse by 80 percent because at the moment the effective use of a car in france is around about one percent 99% of the time, it's not utilized to do its main function, which is moving a person from A to B. So this is the kind of the power of software. And the, the open source communities just want to keep reducing stuff and they're highly motivated to do that. So these hyperscalers are the ones that have kicked it all off and they've changed the whole kind of purchasing model and driven manufacturers to, to fall in line. That's the power of that, that size. There's other nasty things about big players, but they've really turned the world on its head when it comes to uh, data centers. Oh, interesting. Uh, we have a question here from Stefan Frenzel. Will Lars Shedin, with his innovative data center site in Falun, Sweden, reach scope three? So will, I think it's Eco Data Center, will they reach scope three? Um, I love what they're doing now. And uh, I just discovered it all by accident. And when one day I saw these uh, photographs of a wooden data center, I've always felt that uh, wood is something that we should be using as a construction material. Because effectively what it does, it, you're taking the embodied carbon that the trees are capturing from the atmosphere and you're maintaining it because you're not burning it you're just keeping it in a solid format. So it has this fantastic way of um, encapsulating carbon in the building. Whereas if you look at a traditional data center, you it's built from mass concrete and steel. And one of the biggest contributors to uh, carbon emissions is concrete. And I can take you up to Scandinavia, and I can take you into data centers in Finland, for example, where you will see a uh, floor slabs you'll see floor slabs that are one meter thick solid concrete with reinforcing in them uh, and they have to build them like that because they have this ridiculous legacy um, uh, requirement when they were paranoid about the russians dropping bombs on them that they had to put crucial stuff in the basement and put a one meter concrete slab above it so when you go up there you see these hugely massive concrete they're like bunkers and I would argue that a lot of the data centers you see built in the UK, they're, they're built like bunkers, this mass concrete, and it's a huge impact. And again, it's scope free. Nobody seems to be considering it. And I think when they start to consider scope free, you will see a radical transformation in the way data centers are built. And if you go to Sweden, it's quite amazing what they're doing up there. And some of the best innovations I've seen in Sweden are actually done by guys from London which is quite weird. Uh, uh, they just identify, Hydro 66 is a group of fellas uh, from London 
and they just sort of sat down, did the crazy numbers, and they said, hang on, if we go up there and we just build this very simple data center, uh, we, we can easily be the lowest carbon emitting data center in the world, and, and we can do it at the lowest possible cost. So they're building their data centers at a fraction of the price of a traditional data center. Um, and it's just so radical. Um, so scope free is gonna be big. Um, what I love about Lars though, when I talk to him, he's, he admits he's not an expert. Now an expert is someone who takes 10 years to know more and more and more about less and less and less. And I think what we have as a problem is we have too many experts in the data center industry that are holding back the data center industry. And up until I discovered open source tech, I felt I was an expert, but I no more do I think I'm an expert because an expert closes his mind, closes his mind, blinkers himself. And what you guys are doing is wonderful because what you're doing, you're starting to unblinker people and you're starting to say, why don't we kind of move away from this blinkered silo and start joining and integrating with the energy infrastructure? It just makes sense. So my Eureka moment was about uh, eight years ago and uh, it's wonderful to see you guys what you're doing today and I really do hope that you can bring these parties together and to start to really explode the integration uh, and the potential is huge. Now that probably yeah. didn't just answer um, Stefan's question, but um, <laughs> I've got a lot to say. <laughs> But I, I have a follow up to Stefan's question. So you, you mentioned these 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 blokes from London going up to Sweden, building a, a very a low impact uh, data center effectively. Are there standards and um, that are preventing people from doing it here? How what is the standards process, you know, and, and is that restrictive in any way? Uh, now, perhaps I, I've got to say I've, I've been thinking it for a long time. Part of the problem is the Uptime Institute uh, requirements. The, their legacy, they, they, they were developed in the days of building um, a, a data center that had an IBM mainframe in it. Now, it was generally a single building and it had to be really resilient. And so what you did, you just kept bundling in more and more hardware resilience. Um, but then what happened is there was a DARPA project. It was a military project in America that was started uh, because the Americans were getting a bit worried. If the Russians dropped bombs on us, we would lose this data center and we'd lose all our compute. So this technology started called TCIP. And the concept of TCIP is that you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You network them and distribute them into multiple data centers. Now that happened many, 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 many years ago. And the problem we've got today is people are still building their data centers based on non-distributed risk, as though everything's still in the one basket, whereas the, the, the hyperscalers and the people who use open source don't do that. They, they just say, well, the, the argument is the software combined with the hardware will create the uptime resilience that you need and it starts to break the back of this hardware only redundancy message so that's really what's key to a lot of the data centers still being built with this hardware obsessive hardware redundancy when you no longer need it because we're not far away where we can just lose a data center and those apps will just carry on working somewhere else and we're at that stage now with the hyperscalers. Uh, there's stories that perhaps I can't tell, but they can lose a huge data center and nobody knows it's happened. And there's some really interesting stories that might come out in time about huge failures in these data centers, but nobody, no user experienced, uh, they didn't even see a fall off. It wasn't a case of losing service. It was a case of, they didn't even see a performance degradation. So I think, we need to break the back of some of these old standards. Um, but there's a problem. The standards are supported by the vendors. The vendors have, are very, very big marketing machines and they want people to buy their stuff. And so I think this is why I'm very much driven 
on the user side. The users should start to drive this, but we need to educate them so they become prosumers. They, they get professionally interested to influence the design of the facility. And uh, that's what I really uh, think is holding a lot of it back. Um, and I'm probably going to, I'll say it now, piss off some of the uh, manufacturers, but so what? Uh, we need to change. Someone needs to say it. It's interesting you talk about that, um, uh, that approach to availability. So what the, some of the hyperscalers are doing, they have availability zones and regions, and that means you basically look at the availability of the system as opposed to the availability of the individual data center asset. So you, the system is, the, is multiple assets and software and redundant fiber, as opposed to a hugely redundant individual asset. Yeah. By, by viewing it as a system, you 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 get like you said, you can, one asset can go down, but it doesn't matter that the system is still alive. And and what you're saying is we need to update the the standards, uptime standards, rather than being uptime for a data center, it should be uptime for the for a system. For Absolutely. Example. And and uh, I sat and had a conversation with uptime back in 2006 in uh, 2016 in in the USA in California at a conference, and I was just saying we need to kind of rethink the way we th this standard works based on hardware redundancy all the time because this software is destroying that and it's you're going to devalue it and but an uptime tried to address it but it's such a difficult problem to address to come up with standards where you integrate the sophistication of software moving applications around failures in hardware uh, and they did have an attempt and they produced a document and it was, but it's not gone far enough. And I think that the, as the software starts to move on and cover these implications on not just making hardware more efficient, but also covering the loss of a piece of hardware, then those old hardware only redundant uh, solutions, they're, they're gonna die, but it takes education to try and um, kind of break and make a new change. And I get very frustrated with experts who all the time keep dragging themselves back to the old ways of doing things. And uh, what we need, we need more young people like uh, the chap sitting next to me on this screen who can start um, asking the questions that uh, in a meeting, for example, with an expert, that will start to make the users question the expert and i think that's fundamental that we we need to question the experts there there you're essentially saying the experts rep represent an entrenched view that was probably moved on or is potentially inefficient nowadays because we have a lot of technological progressions that mean we don't need to be so entrenched that, uh, I think that's what I take away from what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, there is. And uh, there's a wonderful piece that was written. It's, it, it's, it was written by a chap called Levitt, and it was written in 1960, in, and it's in the Harvard Business Review, and it's called uh, Myoptic Marketing. Myopic mar Marketing. And what's interesting about it, he, he analyzes mindsets. And he analyzes the mindset of uh, providers in industries that are in a growth mode. And they tend to lock themselves in to just doing the same thing because they don't feel under threat because they're in a growth, growth, a growth market. Um, but then he takes the argument further and he shows their failures because they don't change and they disconnect from the end user. They disconnect from the customer. Effectively, they become arrogant and they fail. And it's a wonderful paper to read, um, uh, as I say, uh, and I, I don't, oh yeah, in the back of my slide deck, I've referenced Levitt and I've put a piece in there about Levitt. So if you distribute the slide deck as a PowerPoint, people can go and read that information and you'll see this wonderful story that I feel is so real today because everybody's kind of hyping up the uh, the growth in IT. But the problem is, it's not going to be IT like we used to do it. It's going to be different. And if you can't change, you're going to fail. Interesting. Um, 
I'm moving on now to a question from Rafael. Hi, John, absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. What do you think are the top three things that would help make open source become mainstream? I think education a lot of the time is, is really important, education. Um, but education with people with open minds, I think is key. Uh, I think that's fundamental. Um, but the other thing that's gonna change it is legislation. There's going to be legislation coming through, especially in Europe, and you're going to see it. It's just going to go everywhere. I'm sure it is. Um, a lot of people don't know this. Here's a little story. Um, in France, the French government back in 2014 brought in a policy that for all public purchased ICT solutions, open source software should be used if it was available. Right now, they brought that policy in back in 2014. Now, what's interesting, you can go around and uh, go around France and have a look at some of the, the expertise in open source. And there's a, a great example of what it's done to the whole economy, how it's stimulated the French uh, expertise in this open source tech. Like OVH is a French company, and I believe that that is part of that policy decision back in 2014. But a prime example, one of the best example, is a company called uh, Talis. Now, Talis, now it's totally into open source solutions. It does a lot of military work. It does stuff for the nuclear industry. But it now employs 9,000 9, open source software engineers. Now, I honestly don't believe they would be in that position if that policy decision wasn't made back in 2014. Now, there's some wonderful research that's been done. There's a guy, a researcher uh, who's from Harvard Business School, who's done research on the impacts of these policy decisions in open source and what it's done to the to the industries in those countries that have uh, implemented these policies. And it's all very positive. And that's why the European Union there are funding these research projects to get the evidence base to force through the policies on open source. And it's now not just going to be about open source software, it's open source hardware as well. And it also starts to bring in this, the kind of the, the real magic. Once you get all three opens working together, you get this huge synergy that occurs and it just takes ICT and digitization to a new, new plane. So that's that's the aim is is essentially once open source gets to critical mass, it basically takes care of itself. And the difficulty is getting it there and overcoming entrenched views, like you said, the expert view, but also entrenched interests, which are traditional vendors. So mm. so let's assume, uh, be it via regulation or, or otherwise, it's, it's reached critical mass. How do you think hardware manufacturers like Dell and HP and Co., how would they respond? Would they simply have adopt it and become part of that ecosystem? Um, <laughs> it's a lot of hypotheticals, I know. No, it's good because um, what's the best way to answer this? Um, the thing about people in open source, they have a very uh, broad world view. They honestly do believe that they are going to change the world. But what they're doing is truly a value at global scale. And sometimes that means that the old kind of legacy um, producers of hardware um, will have to disappear. And What's the best way to put this? The perhaps in the future, the big brands that you know, like the you know the Ericsons, the the Cisco's, the HP's, um, the Dell's, might not be selling hardware anymore. And a lot of that hardware they don't make anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when the open source community first got together, it was Facebook, a group at Facebook. They didn't want the traditional 
enterprise servers because they, there was a lot of stuff in there they didn't need. Uh, a traditional enterprise server is basically a desktop PC that someone picked up and stuck in a rack. And they said, well, why do we need all this stuff on it? We don't, we don't use it. So they went to Dell, they went to HP and said, can you make a server that's tuned for our data centers? And they said, no, because at the time they were very small. So uh, Facebook just went and recruited one of the design engineers from uh, Dell and uh, six people took themselves off to Taiwan and they designed their own servers. And they designed it with the manufacturers, with the people who actually make the hardware. And then they brought it back and they christened the first server that they ever created called the Freedom Server, because it was freedom from all the hassles and the hardships of dealing with the traditional vendors. Uh, and that's how, in fact, the open source uh, foundation, OCP, started. Because once they'd created these, these products, they just open sourced them and put them into this community. So will they change? I'm not sure they will. I think what they'll do, the traditional vendors, uh, the big brand vendors, they'll extract themselves from hardware and they will become software services businesses um, in the future. And I, when I talk about the future, I mean this decade. That's my, that's my hunch. And it's good fun kind of just um, surmising some of the partnerships that will be there. For example, will Cisco and uh, Ericsson become partners in a software services business? If they do, what will be the name for the company? Um, I just think it's really interesting what's happening and strategically the Cisco are driving towards reducing their dependence on hardware sales. They've changed the way they sell hardware now. They sell it in a different way to the way they used to, to reduce the upfront cost. And then they basically lock people in on a license deal because they just can't compete with these, uh, what these prosumers are doing in terms of hardware development with big players that most people have never heard of, like Inspur, WeWin, uh, MyTech, most people have never heard of them, but they're the people who have always made the hardware and they're working with the, the user and they're opening up the technologies with them. And there's lots of benefits. And one that I really love is a, a new product that's coming through. And it's basically a server that's full of GPUs. And the prosumers have got together with the manufacturers and they've now come up with an agreement and developed an open socket. So that's really special in, in my book because you've now got all these different people making um, uh, GPUs, but they all have a common socket. Now that's really a profound change in my book. And this is what we need to move towards sustainability because at the moment, the current status is you've got a motherboard, I've got an Intel socket on it. I can't just pull that Intel uh, chip off and put another one on. I literally have to condemn the whole solution. And I think that's the kind of thing we need to get to. Um, and it's good for the manufacturer because the manufacturer's development costs, they're slashed. The speed of development is much, much faster. Uh, so I think there are benefits for hardware manufacturers working with prosumers, prosumers um, on this. So we, we just have to wait and see. But I think there's going to be a lot of change uh, in this decade that's going to really disrupt the market and the next place where it's really going to hit is the telco market. So on that, so we have uh, by the end of the decade, open source hardware, open source software, open source data um, and that complete interoperability that that gives you and that's going to be quite a game changer for the the digital ecosystem as we know it. W what do you mean when you say telcos are going to be involved uh, more so than they currently are? Well, the, the telcos historically, um, they have a different kind of mind. I'm ex-telco, I'm ex-BT. And uh, it was quite a revelation to me when I started mixing with all these kind of open source nerds that were doing crazy stuff and it just blew my mind. Um, <laughs> Just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I, I always remember when I, I went into um, 
I was doing some consultancy work for Facebook up in northern Sweden in their Lulia data center. And I remember walking into that place. Now, I've been designing data centers for 20 years. And I remember walking in there and I'm looking around me and I'm going, where's this? Where, where's all the other stuff? Where's all the redundant? Where, where, where is it all? Why are they? Why is nobody walking around the back of the racks? Why is everybody doing it from the front? And I'm just my my world was all I was disoriented. It's like I was drunk. And then I started, you know, I'm sitting there in the evening having a beer and uh, I'm thinking this is absolutely radical. And what the telcos in there are deciding is that they've seen this technology and they're realizing just how radical it is once you integrate it with software. And you're now starting to get the telcos are moving into basically creating uh, what they call central offices re-architected as data centers. So they're basically going to convert all the world's telephone exchanges to this technology because it's dirt cheap. It's really low cost the way you do it. The dematerializations, you know, it's easy to achieve 80% dematerialization and that massively reduces your costs. But then what it also gives them, because they're now virtualizing everything, it gives them agility to cope with these massive kind of swings in bandwidth and growth rates that they can't cope with when you've got a proprietary piece of hardware. Before, when a, a telco wanted to provide a service to a customer, you'd literally get a physical box. You put one of them inside the customer's premises and you'd have one in the telephone exchange. You don't do that anymore. You're in a position today where if a client wants to buy a service from a telco, it's just, it's physically, you grab that service, drop it into a box on your computer with your mouse, use it for as long as you like, pick it up and throw it out again, and it does all the billing, it does all the transactions. It's just so special. But with the telcos, once they have done this conversion in order to massively reduce their costs, what you're going to find from that is the telephone exchanges will then become the edge data centers for cities. And this is where it's really profound. And this is going to happen in the next five years. Why is it profound is because it totally destroys the cost economics on running, setting up infrastructures in smart cities and IoT. Why does it do that? Because once the telco has its virtualized infrastructure in the telephone exchange, which is roughly four kilometers radius from any node within a city, the, the latency problem disappears. Because four kilometers of fiber, they, you just ignore the latency on it. It's just, you ignore it. And what's so special about it is going to allow people to bring up virtual instances like the hyperscalers can bring up a virtual instance if they want edge computing in the telephone exchange, my local telephone exchange. And I will use that if I've got a latency issue trying to commute to um, the, the big data center that might be 500 miles away in Sweden. Now, the impact of that is profound because the telcos are then in a position to provide cloud services at almost zero marginal cost for the new applications for smart cities and IoT. And that really, I think, is going to be the biggest thing that's going to hit in this decade is zero marginal cost services yeah, being sold by the telcos from their telephone exchanges with partnerships with other people that can help them with the software because it's just a software problem. I think that's really going to be something special. And the great thing about that is it gets back to the SDIA again because it's all about smart cities. It's about intelligent integration of everything. And I think that's really going to make SDIA become very attractive to lots of people when this true smart city IoT joining things together and creating these huge intelligent systems sitting on networks. That's going to be, I'm very uh, optimistic about SDIA and that's why I'm so keen to <laughs> work with you guys because I, I think you're taking it to a whole new level. And once we get this, um, once we start to work out the how we do this carbon accounting, and that's just a software problem, but we just haven't done it yet, um, then I think it'd be really special. And I think in the future, as we move more and more towards renewables, 
energy production is going to be zero marginal cost as well. And if it is, then what do we focus on in the future? I don't think we'd be focusing on energy, we'll be focusing on carbon emissions. And we still don't even really measure them at the moment, and we, we, we fully don't understand it. But I think that's going to be the real big thing in the future. So there's a wonderful company in uh, Denmark called Tomorrow. Uh, and they are doing some really clever stuff uh, with software, open source software, and working with big hyperscalers like Google to move workloads around into areas where the electricity has very low carbon emissions at certain times because it's renewable. So they move the workloads between data centers to lower the carbon emissions. And I think that is gonna be a really big thing um, this decade. Um, and again, the more we can integrate it and start looking at all the embodied stuff, I think it's really gonna fly. Um, but at the moment, I don't know anybody who's developed any software that can measure, for example, the uh, embodied software in the physical data center building. I, I just don't know any, and it, it's, a, it's a relatively simple tool to do. Once you've got all the kind of database there and the database exists for all the embodied carbon, it's been there for years. Bristol University developed it years ago. So it, you could actually just build your, the design of your data center and from that database, say in AutoCAD, you could get the carbon footprint. And if the designer is motivated by reducing the carbon footprint, then he just modifies the design in order to optimize the carbon footprints. But at the moment, they're not doing it. Mm. But uh, it's kind of starting. Yeah, it is starting. So Trevor Hinkle is head of the electricity map. Uh, that you were talking about at the company tomorrow and they're working with Google. Trevor spoke on um, on Tuesday and his uh, his presentation will be online as well after the conference. Mm. There are two things there, which was the load, load shifting, but also carbon accounting and the different ways you can do that, location-based versus marginal-based versus market-based. Market-based is how we do it currently, and that's not very accurate. That doesn't take in, really to account the real the real world and the real flows um yeah. last question i want to give you john before i move on to Lasse's presentation uh john can you explain this is from neil uh neil atmaka can you explain what is an ocp ready facility what are the cr criteria to meet um i'll tell you how it started um i was sitting down with a chap one day called mark dancy and we were talking about an experience of a very big company, a big gaming company that had tried to roll OCP equipment out around the world to about two dozen data centers, colos, all around the world. And I was telling him about all the horrific stories because OCP gear, you don't put the rack in place and then bring all the servers in in cardboard boxes and unpack them and put them in. The rack turns up, it's fully loaded, it's fully working, ready to go. You wheel in this rack and it can weigh about one and a half ton. And you wheel it into place, you plug the power cables in, you plug four optic uh, cable links in, and then you switch it on and it just auto configures and it works. Here's the problem. Colo data centers were just not set up for that kind of uh, physical implementation. All sorts of problems like ramps and everything that could go wrong on this project went wrong. Uh, the, ramp, the ramp angles were too steep and they got the cabinet to the ramp but they couldn't push it up the ramp. <laughs> so they had to empty all the equipment out the rack and these equipment racks, like there's, there's over a hundred thousand pounds worth of gear in them so you've got to be very careful. So everything was terribly slow. So talking to Mark Dancy we said why don't we provide some guidance? And he was working on a project at the time, rolling out a huge project around Europe, like a billion dollar project, a huge project. And he said, I'm having all sorts of problems. We can't get the racks off the lorries um, because the lorries are turning up with the racks weighing one and a half ton. They've used a big heavy forklift to put them in. But when they get to the data center, there's no one with a forklift that can take one and a half ton off. So the well, what they had to do, he told me these stories about that to back two articulated lorries and put them together like that, slide one rack into the back of the other one, then separate, and then they could use the, the, the moving platform 
to lower the racks to the floor. And he just told me all these horror stories about trying to get into the building. And so from that, we just said, what are the horror stories? And so it covers everything to do with like the physical. Can you get the stuff in the building? Um, will the floor cope? If it's access floors, will it cope? And generally in a, an old data center, it won't. Um, it's almost like trying to move in mainframes. Um, and they, if, if the data center is designed correctly, you can take an OCP rack, you can get it off the lorry, it, it's packed in a special crate, uh, the front of the crate comes down with a ramp on it, you wheel it out, you can literally get two guys to install between one and 2,000 servers and switch them on and get them working in a day. But you can take a single rack and install it, you know, on its own in like 20 minutes. And there's a wonderful video that has been done by Hydro 66 up in Sweden, and it shows you how they move a rack in uh, in about 20 minutes from delivery to site, switch it on, all working, job done. Now that's 250 times faster than the traditional installation in a data center. Um, and it's just, it, what we're trying to do is get people to design data centers for the technology, which we believe is the future. And we're seeing the ramp of this technology, this hardware just going through the ceiling. So the latest uh, one was, uh, in fact, just this week, I think it was, um, Chaora, a big new data center player in China, just got certified. And you basically go through a checklist. But if you need any detail, find Mark Dancy. He's the, the, uh, the guy who kind of um, adopted it after we brainstormed it on a piece of paper in a pub, I think it was. <laughs> and that's how it all started. But it's... Does your site data center easily accept these technologies? Excellent, uh, brilliant. So thank you, John, for your presentation and for letting me pick your, pick your mind for about 30 minutes. <laughs> um, I just wanna give you a 30 second, you know, uh, goodbye. So please, you know, uh, you can tell the audience where to find uh, more information on what, what OCP and what you're doing uh, before I introduce Lassa as our last speaker of the day. I'd just like to say thank you. I'd like to say thank you for uh, the conversation that I had with uh, Max. Um, it must have been, I don't know, two or three years ago now. And we sat down in a data centre conference in uh, the city of London and we just scribbled things out. And uh, it was really inspirational because I felt that we had a this alien this alien view that i felt of the i had of the world i found someone who had the same alien view of the world <laughs> and he's managed to find people uh like you and lassie and everybody else uh and so that this kind of and it's this change in the consciousness that's happening which i'm really inspired by and i think that's really i'd shake your hand there uh <laughs> <laughs> um, and because I think you're doing a grand job on changing the consciousness of, of the industry and broadening it into the wider picture, like integration with the power infrastructures. And that's where we need to be going. So well done. Um, fantastic. And thanks for listening. Um, if you need anything, talk to him. He's got loads of information because I get about a thousand new connections every month on on uh, LinkedIn and it drives me mad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. So John, John's uh, presentation is obviously you can download the PDF. Uh, it's also online. It will be online at the end of the uh, conference on Friday. So thank you, John. Now to introduce Lassa. Lassa is our COO at the STIA. He'll be talking about sustainability in digital infrastructure. Unfortunately, he's not here um, in person. He's on, on holiday this week, uh, so I will play his presentation. There will not be a Q&A after the presentation. There will just be a sort of a, a wrap up and, uh, and that'll be all. So without delaying further, I'll put on Lassa's presentation.
All right. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to have you here. My name is Lasse Schneppenheim. I have a background in energy and environmental management, and I am working in data center energy efficiency since three years now. Just as a heads up, this is not a live session. This is a recording. I unfortunately cannot be available today. Um, for your questions, one of my colleagues will be uh, ready to answer them after the, this recording. All right. When thinking about technology solving humanity's problems, the one that I come up with is digitalization. In the beginning, it was expected to be like uh, solving it by default. Uh, you might, uh, if you probably know the phrase, um, please consider the environment before printing this email. And I think that is quite a good example. But today we know that's not the case by default. Um, the digitalization has a very strong impact on our environment as well. And this is why I want to explain in more detail today why we need to think about sustainability in digital infrastructure now and how the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance facilitates the journey towards it. Before we start off, just to make sure we are on the same page about this, um, sustain means to maintain, in this case a certain status or standard. Um, we talk about a standard of living that can be maintained for a long time without exceeding environmental, social and economic limits. And uh, in this sense, the UN has defined it as the following. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. When we look at the, in this case, simplified supply chain of digital infrastructure, we realize there are a lot of aspects to consider when we're talking about sustainability. The main categories uh, of it are hardware production, the operation of data centers and networks, software application and consumer devices and end of life uh, considerations. Within that we have flows of uh, mostly resources, energy and pollutants of course. Uh, so digitalization has a big impact on the physical world, especially when we look at the operations of data centers. Um, they require hardware and their production in the first place. They require energy, cooling, they emit waste heat, and they require maintenance and a facility building that needs to be constructed. So while the whole value chain is part of digital infrastructure, we see, as I said, a lot of impact happening at the, what we call the underlying digital infrastructure, which applies to data center and network operation and its sphere of influence. This is therefore a visualization of what the underlying digital infrastructure is. You see this involves also the energy system, including the electricity grid, power plants and potential heat demand. We see there is a change, an exchange going on actually, and this kind of exchange will become more and more uh, instead of just building bilateral agreements where you purchase one service or, for example, electricity um, and then pay for it and then you're done. Um, there will be more multilateral agreements, enabling business models that create value on both sides and help the to solve the challenges on both sides. We start seeing this when we talk about sector coupling, for example. So with this physical impact of the digital world happens exactly where this digital infrastructure is. So where a data center is situated, for example. And why is this a problem? Um, the problem is becoming increasingly aware when you look at how the demand for digital infrastructure is growing. Um, more digital services in every part of our lives are driving demand for storing and processing data. And the data centers are the engine room of the digital economy and even more though in the age of the cloud. This is why electricity usage is rising uh, in data centers. Um, this graph shows a base, uh, worse and a best case scenario. Um, numbers on these scenarios can change or can vary significantly 
depending on uh, the different studies and when they have been um, conducted that is because we are it is really dependent on efficiency measures that apply on consolidation and merger and acquisition um, phases that represent the change in this industry the rapid change and um, that is something that I come to later why this is important and efficiency measures like I mentioned before have and the consolidation or rather like the merger of data centers into for example cloud um, data centers have kept energy consumption at a certain level um, however it is not certain that they these um, efficiency uh, gains will outweigh the increase of uh, of demand um, over the long time we expect um, demand and energy consumption to and resource consumption to grow if we don't keep working towards a more sustainable digital infrastructure. Why do we think about it now? Well, I have three good reasons. We are right in the search of a new environmental awareness. Uh, public, governmental and even the attention from the capital side is bigger than ever. And if we don't also put digital infrastructure on the map, we will end up building it with the same principles of the old age. Um, and that leads to the next point, because we want to solve problems with the tool of digitalization, problems that have been caused by how we handled things in the f uh, before, and we don't want to cause more problems the same way. So I think um, this should be the underlying value of all our actions, that we do not try to create more problems by solving some. Or, and we can discuss if we are solving more problems than we are creating new ones, but I prefer not to create any or as little as possible in the first place. And as I mentioned before, we are in a time of growth and change in the industry and demand is increasing and the way the, it's, everything is structured is changing. And I think that is the ideal point of time to know or to define what desired standards there are to build this digital infrastructure, what we require them in terms of sustainability, what we require in terms of capability and accessibility. And um, that is simply easier than in a matured uh, industry. And I suggest we don't wait until the industry is matured to then um, try to change it. Another way to look at this is from this angle as well. Um, we are right in the face of two of the biggest trends right now, which are the trend towards, towards more sustainability especially by changing to renewable energy to avoid CO2 emissions. The energy transition has been mainly focused on the producing green electricity, but to put this simply, we need to go further than this. Uh, the, then the trend of digitalization, we moved away from physical and analog forms of storing and sending information. With that, we are able to completely reshape the way our economic economy and world works. We need it for more sustainability and to progress in the energy transition as well as for solving many other problems such as social inequality, uh, understanding our world better in terms of scientific uh, research or to ease the already ongoing climate change. If we follow these trends um, and progress in them successfully, we will end up in a smart and sustainable future, enabling a smart energy system based on renewable energy that optimizes automatically and uses resources efficiently and comprehensively, supporting thereby innovation by making digital resources accessible to everyone so that innovators can use these resources to solve our problems even better. So digitalization can support the energy system, right? That's what I just said. But the needed digital infrastructure so far is rather increasing the demand for more energy and therefore its impact on the environment. So how can we change this? We believe there are actually ways to fundamentally change this so that the digital infrastructure is not just having an, like is not just a burden but actually uh, supporting the energy system of the future. And I have a few examples and concepts how this can be done. For example, we need to find ways to cool efficiently and use the waste heat from data centers. This is not just needed to um, reduce the carbon impact, it is needed to use the waste heat because 
we will demand or we will have a higher demand for CO2 free heat in the future. Um, we currently talk about the energy transition <coughs> as an electricity transition, but actually it also involves mobility and the heat sector. And with the change away from burning fossils, we have less sources that are actually fossil free for heat. So we need to learn to use waste heat sources like for data centers, but also from uh, uh, other industrial processes. Then we need to look deeper into how we, we supply data centers effectively with renewable energy. Just by finding a, a provider that sells a tariff with renewable energy, that doesn't help. We need to uh, be become a better customer. Um, purchasing renewable energy in a way that actually incentivizes building new renewable energy and also um, the, reacting maybe to the fluctuating supply of renewable energy in a certain way. For this, server utilization and their management can help. Currently, servers run on very low utilization rates sometimes in, in data centers, still using a lot of energy. And uh, by actually optimizing them, for example, using those uh, low demand times to ma maybe run other processes, um, like scientific research or rendering processes, can actually um, increase the efficiency of the overall system. And this capability to change and shift loads can help us to react on renewable energy fluctuations and therefore um, make the data center a little bit more flexible. Fourth, we need to find good locations for data centers. So far, they are being, they are being, bu being built uh, directly into urban centers or into the major hubs um, where they have a scarcity in space, but also more importantly, they have a scarcity in renewable energy. It's really hard to supply these centers uh, on these uh, really dense um, metropolitan areas with enough renewable energy that often comes from rural areas. So um, does every data center really need to be built directly in the middle of the um, Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam or Paris region? Probably not. And um, the, uh, we can move s certain data centers certainly to a um, to other locations where there is renewable energy available and CO2 forms. That does not just include, for example, um, Nordic areas, but also within the Central European countries or Southern European countries. There are areas that are better suited than the metropolitan areas. And fifth, um, uh, one topic that I really like is what can you do with alternative forms of emergency power supply? So data centers require aggregates uh, or re require units for emergency power supply. Mostly they are based on diesel generators and diesel generators, of course, you don't want them to be running more than needed um, because they cause emissions, not just CO2 emissions, but also um, dust and other forms of uh, emissions that are bad for the, for the area actually around it. So you want to avoid it, but imagine you have a, you have a emergency power supply system that has the same capacity as um, actually the data center cons uh, energy consumption and you could run it whenever you want not just in emergency cases so if you run them for example on renewable hydrogen you could actually help um, the grid by being like a storage system for them and if there is a, a, a low supply of renewable energy at certain times when there's little wind and little solar you can turn on the, um, the emergency power system and supply green energy from the hydrogen tank. So, so these are just a few examples. And as you see, they are based um, strongly on the cooperation with other sectors. And this is why we formed an alliance of like-minded organizations who drive the sustainable transformation of digital infrastructure. Creating a sustainable digital infrastructure that has zero negative of impact on the environment while driving the competitiveness of the sector. Our mission is that we are the catalyst for the industrial cooperation. Um, together with our members, individuals and governments, we measure the environmental impact of the digital economy. We promote a roadmap towards 
uh, economically and ecologically sustainable digital infrastructure. We do this by combining the pillars of compute, power and network into a unified voice represented by the SDIA. And we promote the sustainable digital infrastructure that underpins the digital economy and build the roadmap towards net positive digital infrastructure. Thereby driving research and commercial implementation on new technologies to reach the targets. We do this together with our members, a network of companies and organizations who share the SDAA's vision on sustainability in digital infrastructure and represent the entire value chain. And that is really a strength of this alliance. With that being said, thank you very much for joining in. I know it was a quick and vivid presentation and I hope that it has caught some uh, attention for our work and its importance in these days. In this case, we would love to hear from you. Join the discussion with us and our members. We are looking forward to it. If you want to dive deeper into the topics, I recommend listening to Mohan Gandhi presenting our roadmap um, to sustainable digital infrastructure in 2030 or many of the other experts that are presenting during this conference. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you Lasse for that presentation. So like I said, Lasse can't be with us today, so he won't be here for the Q&A. So if anyone has any last questions, then please fire them off to me now and I can, I'll can i try and answer them. Uh, if not, um, I will go through the, uh, the lineup for tomorrow. So tomorrow is the last session of the conference, uh, the last day, and it's on our hardware. So uh, Deborah Andrews, Associate Professor at London South Bank University, we're talking about uh, curving the line to circularity in the data center. Ali Fenn, President of IT Renew, uh, IT Renew is someone John was talking about earlier. Uh, she'll be talking about um, the power of sustainable IT infrastructure and circular economic models. Um, and lastly, Sophia Flucker, she's a data center expert based in London, will be talking about the total data center environmental impact. So it's our hardware session tomorrow, starts at 10 European time, 9 UK time. Um, please, please get involved. Like I said before, the handouts are all available uh, as PDFs now and the video recordings will be made available at the end of the conference. Um, if no one else has any questions, I will end the session there and uh, hope you all have a, have a great day. Just the last question here, perhaps. Okay, thank you everyone and um, I'll see you tomorrow.